Loudspeaker Studios. From Loudspeaker Studios in beautiful Fort Collins, Colorado, you are listening to Talking Trauma with Zach B. Beans? It's Beans, right? God Bines. damn it. Bines. Zach Bines. Welcome to our show. Welcome to our show. It's a good show. Tromaville, and welcome to a very special episode of Talkin' Troma with your host, me, Zach Bynes, coming at you from the loudspeaker studios here in Fort Collins, Colorado. So, uh, I just want everybody to know that I am not dead. This is not a message from the grave. Or well, maybe it is, but it's not. Um, I just wanted everybody to know that I have not forgotten about you or the show. But life happens, and uh, this new season of the show is a, a ton of research, which I'm pretty excited to talk about what I got going on. But I'll pull back the curtain a little bit so you can see what's coming up on the show on Talking Troma. Also, so you can see a little bit of what's coming up at Troma. Um, and I also wanted to introduce a special guest. The reason why I'm here in the uh, studio today. One of the longest term trauma employees of all time after Lloyd and Michael and their families, Mr. Chris Lamphere. Hello, hello. How are we doing? Very good. Chris, you're also producing the show. So, uh, yes. Thank you so much. People uh, were a little nervous when I said I was getting a producer, but I felt very <laughs> confident uh, that you would be a perfect choice for that because of your tenure at trauma. What You've worked there for how many years? I was hired in 1999 and have held various roles between part-time, full-time, volunteer since then. What was some of your main roles at Troma or what are you still doing at Troma these days? So these days I handle the management of uh, Troma's online properties. So Troma.com, TromaDirect.com, a little bit of Troma Now. Um, and our various different like web presences. Um, but in the past, uh, I was also part of our marketing team, um, worked a little bit in acquisitions and distribution, and uh, also was the co-director or director of uh, Trauma Dance for a couple of years. It's so awesome. Like we didn't meet each other uh, maybe, you know, like five or six years ago, mm -hmm. but just having another you know, trauma soul in the same state in the middle of Colorado. That's a pretty rare thing. So. It really is. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the only reasons that I've been able to stay associated with trauma for so long is that I don't live in New York and therefore uh, are able to be kept at uh, an arm's length from the main trauma machine. A severed arm's length. Very much so. Yes. <laughs> well, I like to always ask, how did you get introduced to trauma? What's your your trauma background? Uh, it depends on how far back you want to go. Um, I would say my very first exposure to trauma was through USA Up All Night, um, which was a late night show on the USA Network in the late 80s to I think mid 90s was probably when it stopped. Um, but that was a show hosted by Gilbert Gottfried and Rhonda Shear, and they would show um, horror and B and kind of comedy slapstick movies um, late at night on the weekends. And so I think the first trauma movie I saw was one of the Toxic Avengers. I'm not sure it was the first film. It might have been two or three because those two films were shown, it seemed like, in greater rotation yeah. than uh, Toxie 1. But that was my very first exposure. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we can never get forget uh, getting exposed to the first time, so... Yeah, I still have radiation burns. <laughs> uh, and how did you end up working for Trauma, especially like, you know, living in Colorado? Yeah, that's that's a, a somewhat unique story. For me, what it came to was by the time I got to high school, which was the late 90s, Trauma had gotten in my blood and I really wanted to do something to expose more people to it. And I had a uh, significant interest in learning how to do web design, uh, one of my teachers told me, well, the, the best way to learn how to build websites is to build a website about something you really love. So I decided to make a trauma fan website. It was called traumamovies.com. 
And an interesting thing about this time of trauma history is that trauma was in the middle of their own sort of web renaissance where they had the traumaville.com project, um, which we'll talk about later in the show. But I was initially hired to be part of that team. Basically, what happened is that I sent an email off to trauma and said, hey, I hope you guys like this fan site that I built. Please don't sue me. <laughs> and surprisingly enough for me, I got an email back from Lloyd Kaufman and he said, this is wonderful. You clearly are skilled, even though this was the first website I ever really built. <laughs> and he said, would you like to come work for us? And so it kind of became this back and forth. And shortly afterwards, I was hired uh, for Tromaville.com. So Tromaville.com, like this is like, like where you could definitely separate out like when people got into trauma. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yes. If, if they remember traumaville.com or not. There was a line of demarcation for sure. Greetings from the virtual city of Tromaville, official home to all lovers of fiercely independent culture. This groundbreaking internet portal is your key to the most progressive music, movies, games, action sports, and information on the World Wide Web. Join a movement rooted in cutting-edge sights, sounds, and interactivity. Tromaville is the underground platform of the future, where you will find everything you're looking for and exciting new features to satisfy your craving for advanced multimedia entertainment. Experience Tromaville.com and participate in the universal counterculture movement of the future. I, I remember seeing that coming up like when i was in high school there was all the really slick ads where do you live tromaville.com do shopping or watch quick time video or <laughs> you know have your own email i had my own tromaville.com email address tell me more and about tromaville.com because it was very ahead of its time it was very much ahead of its time the idea was that it would be a web-based portal not only for all things trauma but for brands that also complemented the trauma aesthetic, if you will. There were several sites that were part of the Tromaville.com network and family of uh, different properties, among probably the most famous of which was Newgrounds.com, um, which was a flash cartoon website that Tom Fulp founded in the mid 90s and later on became part of Tromaville.com. But the idea was it was a network for people who were into the trauma aesthetic, you know, the punk rock DIY scene the kind of subversive comedy and horror elements. And yes, there was an online store called the Tromaville Mall, spelled M-A-U-L. And there were videos and uh, there was an email service where you could get your own email at Tromaville.com. So the idea was to make it kind of a destination for the internet counterculture, if you will. I remember not just the Troma message boards, but the Tromaville.com message boards, where the Troma message boards, they... Felt very, you know, kind of streamlined. This is trauma stuff. And the Tromaville.com ones like definitely seem like you're stepping into the online punk rock culture. <laughs> Absolutely was. Yeah, um, it was certainly an extension of that. So the trauma, the trauma message board was actually one of the very first things that launched on the first trauma website in 1994. And then a few years later, when uh, they decided to make Tromaville.com a thing, we kind of folded the message boards into Tromaville.com because there was already kind of an established community of people who hung out there. So it just seemed like a logical extension to kind of merge those communities. And it was always cool seeing you post on there because like, oh, Mr. Lamphere, uh, I believe that was your screen name. Very, yes. <laughs> very uh, creative. But Mr. Lamphere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so creative. <laughs> has, uh, you know, had some tips about, you know, upcoming DVDs or just news that was happening around in Tromaville. And it, it's kind of funny to see that you'll that you'll still see you comment on posts like on Facebook or on Twitter, um, just correcting misinformation about upcoming trauma stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I was one of the people I think that embraced the Internet most wholeheartedly because Tromaville.com was a kind of a failed experiment because we launched it with great fanfare in 99 and in 2000, 2001 is when the internet bubble burst. And so Tromaville.com kind of collapsed from within because of that, because I mean, there was millions of dollars of investment into Tromaville.com. We bet big on the kind of coming internet explosion, if you will. Yeah. 
and it exploded in catastrophic ways. But I mean, we did a lot of cool stuff on there. We filmed part of Citizen Toxie at the Playboy Mansion in California. And the main press hook for getting people interested in the Tromaville.com launch was to stream that day's shooting live on Tromaville.com. Now, this was at a time when broadband internet access was not uh, widely in use. So a lot of people were still using dial-up and it was extremely expensive to push live video over the internet. So even though you know people can turn on YouTube now and watch stuff in 4K in, in seconds, um, bandwidth wasn't widely available like that. So we used real player and streamed in this tiny little, tiny little window that was maybe the size of a business card. It was so popular and there were so many people trying to watch that our servers in New York crashed and everybody panicked to try to get those back online because they were broadcasting all day from the Playboy Mansion and we wanted as many people as possible to see that footage. But it was so popular that it kept crashing throughout the day. So people were scrambling, trying to make that work. I remember trying to stream some of that, but my computer was so slow. I would get the page to load up and I don't ever think I got real player to fully load. I'd have to reboot my computer. Yeah, it was a nightmare. Like we <laughs> we underestimated the audience for it or the potential audience of people who wanted to see it. And, you know, even though we were assured many times by the uh, by our Internet hosting company that, hey, we've got enough bandwidth, we've got enough servers, everything is fine. I think we crashed within like two minutes of, of launch. So. It was exciting to see that much interest, but also terrifying, especially because the people who were shooting at Playboy, you know, Lloyd and Brendan and uh, their team were not paying attention to what was going on in New York or what was going on on the website. They were just shooting. And we also had a uh, hostess walking around the Playboy set and talking to people and interviewing between shots, because for those of you who've worked on movies, there's a lot of downtime between action and cut. Uh, after that. So we had someone walking around trying to fill the time. But during that in New York, we were panicking, trying to uh, get the stream (laughs) up for people. And I talked to some people who were able to see it. But yeah, a lot of people were not able to because we were just too damn popular. My how the times have changed. You know, I was also using dial up on a Windows 98. You said she was like walking around interviewing people. Do you know if uh, there's any other footage of Hugh Hefner on that set that maybe she got there might be i think she might have interviewed hugh only the during that time knows for sure (laughs) now interesting thing about that was that he apparently was not particularly well versed in tromaville at the time that this deal was done and the deal was kind of negotiated sort of a back channel through some people who were close to the playboy mansion so i don't think hugh hefner had really any idea what trauma was or what the movie was particularly and he threatened to sue after the movie came out and realized he was in it (laughs) it'll make him look bad Uh, i i suppose yeah the (laughs) the the guy who made his living off of exploiting women for 50 years was concerned about looking bad it was kind of kind of an interesting thing but yeah so There might be other footage out there of Hugh Hefner, but I doubt if it exists, A, I don't think we know where it is, and B, I don't think it would ever see the light of day. Do you know if any of that um, live stream footage does exist still? (sighs) That's a great question. That that is one of the many mysteries of the trauma library. The mysteries of the pyramids. It's practically the mysteries of the pyramids. In fact, the pyramids are probably better documented than (laughs) trauma's uh, video library. That footage may be somewhere. If if it, it exists, it's on a tape somewhere, but God only knows where it is. When the Troma building moved several years ago from Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan to Long Island City, there were significant pieces of material that were tossed out. So I don't know if that footage was retained anywhere. It certainly hasn't popped up. I think everything that we have from the Playboy Mansion that we at least knew we had was included on the DVD extras. Whether there's more, I really don't know. What other cool stuff uh, did you uh, do with the launch of Tromaville.com? I remember the AMP has a hard-on for Tromaville.com CD compilations that came out. Yeah, I mean, part of it was like the punk rock ethos, right? So we wanted to get involved with some punk record labels, and we had a good relationship with Go-Kart Records, who put out the Terra Firmer soundtrack. And we inked this, this small deal with a a relatively not well-known 
label called Amp Records, A-M-P, and uh, they're not around anymore to the best of my understanding. And they, yeah, they did put out a three CD compilation of punk music and some of it was really good and some of it was not so great. I mean, your mileage may vary, but uh, it was branded as Amp Records has a heart on for Tromaville.com and it helps to promote their artists and also get some publicity for Tromaville.com. And so many of those things were pressed that we gave them out with website uh, merchandise orders for years after that. And one of the cool things about those CDs is, uh, so there's three discs and those discs were like packed, like 30 songs a disc. Oh yeah. And Mm -hmm. then, uh, the fourth disc was a surprise trauma movie. So the one I have has, uh, uh, girl school screamers. Oh, that's right. I had forgotten that it had the bonus trauma DVD. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I think that was just whatever backstock of DVDs that we had that may not have been selling as well, (laughs) probably. And the idea was, hey, if we include a trauma movie with it that kind of builds the trauma brand and that'd be a good thing to have. So, yeah, it's kind of a fun collectible. You can still see it pop up on eBay and places like that. But it was a cool way to help promote uh, Tromaville brand. We also had lots of T-shirts. There were giveaways for Tromaville.com T-shirts. And although there are a lot of I am traumatized T-shirts in various forms that were put out between the late 90s and early 2000s, there is a Tromaville.com variant that had the I'm traumatized with Toxie on the front and the Tromaville.com logo in green on the back. And those ones are much more rare because there were not a whole lot of those made. I feel like I see, saw those around. And they also have the where do you live tagline on the back. Yeah. And I do want to say for the co- completest collector out there, when we were talking about that AMP has a hard on for Tromaville.com. It's not just punk compilation. I would say it's almost the soundtrack for Trauma Team Video at that era. So Trauma's Edge TV, all the special features from Mm -hmm. Trauma totally lifted those punk songs uh, from that release to edit together stuff. So it's it's almost like listening to uh, to the Trauma's Edge TV soundtrack. It kind of is. It's a bit of a time capsule between that disc and the Terror Firmer soundtrack and the Tromeo and Juliet soundtrack, those songs got used so many times in special features and DVD extras and uh, various like intro videos we would do. They were used all over the place all the time. Um, because prior to that time, going back to talking about the state of Troma's archives, um, there wasn't a whole ton of music to source, um, even from pre- previous Troma movies, because The soundtracks were not things that were kept or at least were not readily available, which is why, like, whenever you'd hear something from Sergeant Kabuki Man in my PD, it would be like the same like four minute suite that was available from there. And a lot of that came from a previous compilation album that came out, I want to say, in the Netherlands. Yeah, that was called Toxic Tunes from Tromaville. and, And that was used as the source for years for a lot of the trauma features before we started getting those punk bands coming in and contributing to those soundtracks. It'd be really cool if Troma did another, you know, almost like uh, just another punk compilation or music compilation, like tunes for Tromaville. They could use it to finance like a a yacht or something. I'm sure Michael Hers would love that. Um, (laughs) We'll get him a new hovercraft. We could get him a new hovercraft. Yes, he loved that hovercraft from from what I'm told. Yeah, I would love to see something like that. We don't actually have a music department, and we never really did, to be quite honest. The closest that we have had to that in recent years was there was a one-time Troma Records imprint that was created solely to distribute the soundtrack for Citizen Toxie, which has a lot of great tracks on it as well, but... That's the one and only time that Trauma Records has been a thing. Did Trauma Records, they didn't put out the Poultry Guy soundtrack? The Poultry Guy soundtrack just came out. It didn't really have a label attached to it because a lot of the ways that people got the soundtrack was to buy the DVD set that had the soundtrack included. So it wasn't labeled as anything other than just being Trauma. Gotcha. The Citizen Toxie soundtrack is is incredible, but it's like mixed super quiet. So I can always tell when that comes on my shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some great tracks on there, like the Loose Nut stuff and uh, Entombed is on there. Flip is on there. There's some really great tracks and also like the Willie Wisely Cannot Love You Enough uh, song that ended up being used pretty prominently 
in Citizen Toxie. Uh, a lot of people don't know. Here's a fun fact that that song was actually written originally for Tromeo and Juliet but for whatever reason was not included in that film at all or on the soundtrack. And so it got used a few years later for Citizen Toxie instead. You kind of still dabble in the the trauma music stuff a little bit with uh, some of these upcoming soundtrack releases or soundtracks that have come out. Yeah, my, my main involvement there was I had always been a huge fan of the soundtrack to Trauma's War, which was composed by Christopher DeMarco. And several years ago, back in the MySpace days, so this was probably 2007, 2008, somewhere in there, I found Chris DeMarco on MySpace and I said, hey, my name is Chris and I uh, love your music for Troma's War, but that's not anything that we have in the Troma library Like, uh, by any chance. Do you still have the music? I didn't expect him to get back to me because it's, you know, some rando on MySpace, but he did reply back to me and said, yeah, I have the music and I have it digitally transferred because it was recorded back when tape was a thing, kids. Not only do I have it, I'll, I'll happily send you a CD with the score on it. He didn't ask for any money. He just said, I'm just glad someone you know is interested in it. So he sent that to me and I kept it around for years. Several years later, um, some Troma alumni, uh, Justin Martell and Aaron Hamill, who both had worked in the Troma office and Justin Martell later went on to uh, work production management for Return to Newcomb High and for Shakespeare's Shitstorm. The two of them started a label, an independent record label called Ship to Shore Phonograph Company. And I had remained friendly with them when they started their label, and they had initially pursued doing a Toxic Avenger soundtrack release as their first vinyl record. But due to various legal reasons, that didn't work out. But I knew, obviously, they were trauma fans because they kind of grew up in the trauma system. So I emailed them and said, hey, I would love to see the Troma's War music put out. And I know for a fact that it exists because I have a copy of this full score, which doesn't even exist in Troma's offices. So they reached back out to me and asked for a copy of it. So I sent it to them and they said, yeah, we absolutely want to do this. Let's <laughs> let's work together because I had been pursuing it independently for several years to the point where I started a small imprint label called Locked Groove Recording Company. And my plan was initially to put it out and self-release it through my label. And I had been working to get the rights to do that because even even working with trauma, it's not like we can just, you know, take these properties and do what we want with them. There's, you know, a fair amount of negotiation that has to go forward. And they said, well, let's co let's co-produce it. You want to do it. We want to do it. We wouldn't have access to it without you. So we kind of teamed up to release that. And, and that vinyl record came out in 2018. It's such a cool album. I'm glad you guys did that. That way I could. Uh, dance around to survive in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's some really great stuff on there. The the most famous song from Troma's War is a, a vocal track called Alive. And Alive was actually recorded several years prior to the making of Troma's War. Chris had put it, I believe, on one of his previous albums. I think it got some radio airplay, but wasn't very widely known. When he visited the Troma's War set, he played that track for Lloyd Kaufman. And Lloyd said, I want you to do that music for this movie. And that's how he was hired to do Troma's War. And when he played the first cues that he had composed, Lloyd said, where's that song I heard? And he said, oh, well, that's a song called Alive, but that wasn't written for the movie. And Lloyd said, well, yeah, this stuff is great, but I want that song. <laughs> so that's how Alive became part of the score. But everything else in that soundtrack was written specifically for Troma's War. I would love to, like, if they had behind the scenes cameras of Lloyd listening to that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, that's that's the ticket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's probably how it went down. Um, when we were working on the record, we actually flew down to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, where Chris lives and shot a, a documentary with him about the making of the Troma's War music. And you can watch that on Troma now, but also you can also watch it on YouTube. But we talked about the history of the Troma's War music and Chris shares some anecdotes about what it was like when Lloyd first heard that and his experience working on the film. I was invited to come up on a location upstate New York in, the, in Peekskill, I believe. Went and met Lloyd and Michael from Troma. Carried a ghetto blaster with me to, uh, to play him some of my musical pieces. And as I uh, finished up playing him, you know, a few selections, Lloyd says, hey, uh, Alex tells me you're an actor. He goes, well, would you like to do a part in this film? 
I want you to be a really bad guy. I want you to be like a terrorist and capture your friend Alex over here. I said, okay. So uh, they told me to go make my own costume, write my own dialogue, and shot the scene. Took no more than an hour to shoot the whole thing. And uh, the next day I got a call and Lloyd asked me if I wanted to do the, uh, the soundtrack for the feature film. So he related to the idea of the uh, Vietnam War heroes uh, on a personal level as well. And I think that really came through in the music. I wonder what did he talk about his thoughts of seeing the movie after it's all done, like with the AIDS brigade. And he talked about seeing the movie. He talked about uh, apparently trauma rented a huge theater in, in Manhattan for the premiere and invited everybody out. And they all got limos out and first class treatment. Um, and he said he really liked the movie, but that he I don't think he mentioned anything specifically about Senior Sita and the AIDS Brigade. But he did mention that his his main gripe with the movie had nothing to do with the content of the movie at all. And it's more the fact that the way the sound was mixed didn't do any favors to his music. No, well, fair, fair enough. <laughs> so, what, yeah. So one of the great things about putting it out on vinyl was this is the first time that that album has had a physical release of any kind uh, whatsoever. So. Now people can hear, I say now when it's been out for five years, but now people can hear the music as it was originally intended to be heard. Um, and there's also some extras on there that aren't even included in the film as well that were cut out. So it's a treasure trove for trauma soundtrack fans and definitely one of the things I'm most proud of. You mentioned that you also do some work on uh, all the kind of current web iterations of Troma, including mm -hmm. Troma Now. Tell me a little bit more about what you do on Troma Now. Troma Now, it's basically kind of tangential to my work, but my, my main task at Troma is the management of Troma Direct, which is our direct-to-consumer um, online merchandise store where you can buy Troma Blu-rays and T-shirts and posters and things like that. Um, and most recently, what we did was we made it so that Troma, if you buy something on Troma Direct, you can automatically get a free trial to Troma now. So um, I did a lot of the back end sort of programming um, to make that stuff happen. And that's kind of where my involvement with Troma now begins and ends, because we have a team at our provider, Vimeo, that handles like the mobile apps and things like that. I do get a lot of people like, you know, messaging me just uh, about Troma now. If you have a feedback thing, everybody out there, I have heard you, and I'll I'll let Chris know the browsing. <laughs> yes, and and that is uh, there's there's actually work going on quite literally as we speak on the the browsing and discovery uh, features of Troma now, which is probably the greatest area um, available for improvement. We do have a programmer who's working on a lot of that stuff right now. Like we did launch an improved search feature, um, so people can find things more easily because. Much like the physical trauma archives, trauma now can be sometimes difficult to navigate if you're looking for something specific or something that's a little more obscure, like a special feature or something like that. So we do have people working on that and it is improving. And also, too, for those of you who have feedback on things you want to see on trauma now, there is a message board that is part of trauma now. So uh, we do read everything that gets posted there and uh, I read all of them. Lloyd reads most of them. And so if you have the ideas for things you want to see or things that we have missed or mislabeled as tends to happen sometimes, definitely let us know and, you know, we'll hop on it and fix it. Back in the film festival days. Yes. You used to program for Troma Dance uh, and the original Troma Dance when it was in Park City, Utah. Correct. Yeah. My, my first year working on Troma Dance proper was 2003. Uh, and yeah, at that time, as you said, we were still in Park City, Utah before it got moved. But it was really a team effort because we had hundreds of movies that got submitted to us every year. And our our main festival programmer was a man named Jonathan Lees, who was a part of the trauma team for many years and still a friend of the trauma team. Fantastic horror writer. But uh, he would spread the wealth out to get us to get more people to watch these movies. So, you know, a couple of times a year, I would get like an entire giant box full of tapes to watch because there was just way too much stuff to see and not enough time. So yeah, I became part of the selection committee along with Jonathan and along with Lloyd um, and Megan Powers, um, who was part of the trauma team for a long time. And 
also worked a lot on trauma dance. And so, yeah, some of some of the selections that uh, that I picked ended up being part of the festival. So that was really cool to see and, and a cool thing to be a part of. What were some of the standout uh, films that you remember coming through? There's a couple that stand out in particular. One of them was called Kung Fu Kitties. I love Kung Fu Kitties. <laughs> yeah. And it's this awesome, like stop motion ish thing, but with real life cats where the like the mouth is a human mouth that is superimposed onto the cat to make them talk. And they're just like Kung Fu Ninja Kitties. And it's hysterical. And I believe that was on that was on Best of Trauma Dance Volume One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the guys who made that, they were wonderful people to work with and extremely creative individuals. And they came out and volunteered to be part of Trauma Dance. And so that was a lot of fun. And that one got a huge reaction at the festival. And those guys actually went on um, to direct another movie that Trauma put out called Clown Camp Massacre. Correct. Yeah. One movie that Trauma actually picked up for distribution, which is probably what I'm most proud of being a part of in terms of Trauma Dance, was called The Ruining. And it was a, a film that Chris Burgard made that was shot on 16 millimeter over the course of several years. It had to be shot, reshot multiple times because film got stolen and lost and there was like constant production problems. To the point where I think he shot it over the course of six or seven years. They uh, submitted it to Troma Dance. And I remember watching the screener DVD and thinking, this is really interesting. This is this is really kind of it, it didn't necessarily fit the trauma aesthetic in terms of like the, you know, blood, boobs and breasts sort of thing. But it definitely had some subversive elements and had like some really interesting story points. So I pushed hard for that one to be included and Got Lloyd to watch it and he loved it. And Chris and his family came out to Park City when we did the screening. And I basically nagged Lloyd all week to pick up the movie for distribution. And we did eventually put that out on DVD. And uh, it's a great little movie. When you were in Park City, did you go to uh, the actual trauma dances in Park City? Like what, schlep around the main street and freeze your ass off. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, the thing about the thing about trauma, as you well know, Zach, having having worked on films with us, is that whether you're at the, the top of the top of the line or at the bottom of the line, everybody does everything. So I was overseeing the volunteer street team. I was out there, you know, passing out flyers and campaigning every day. I was working with the venue managers in uh, we had one in Salt Lake City at, at a place called Broovies, which was this awesome cinema draft house. And I was actually in charge of like literally running the movies from the projection booth. And then we also worked with the venues in Park City as well. And what's interesting about this is the very first year that I worked on Trauma Dance, which was 2003, I wasn't even 21 yet. And all of our venues and events were at places where there were bars. So uh, we had to kind of like lie or distract a door person for me to get even, <laughs> to even get in to the door to make sure I could do my work. And so that was kind of, that was kind of interesting. For the people who don't know, so Park City is in Utah. In the United States, Utah has some of the strictest liquor laws because it's a, you know, pretty run by the Mormon church, that, that state. So uh, we had that issue too, of people who were not 21 trying to get into venues and it'd be like, oh, the Toxic Avenger, of course, Toxie's 21. Come on in, Toxie. And then it's like <laughs> a 17 year old kid. <laughs> yeah, there there was a lot of that going on, a lot of shenanigans to, to get the job done. But I, I mean, that was some of the best experiences of my young life was was schlepping around at Trauma Dance because, yes, it was freezing cold in Utah in January. Everything is crazy expensive. Everything is cold. Everything is wet. It's not enjoyable on paper. But the energy of everyone that just sort of like surrounded the entire event was a really magical thing to be a part of. It's just so wild because it like you feel like you're in the the trauma trenches in Park City because you see like TMZ and the celebrities walking around and then the the really rich yuppies going to the Sundance Film Festival. And then here you are, a bunch of punk rockers with trauma costumes and signs on sticks just yelling in a megaphone until the police come and yell at you to stop. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, the only police involvement that we had while I was uh, running things there was one year we had PETA as a sponsor and they had a youth specific movement of PETA called PETA 2. And as part of that, 
they had a cute, cuddly mascot fox that was running around with a sign of a, a dead fox skeleton on it. Not my cup of tea, but sponsor money is sponsor money. And they went into a fur store with some of our volunteers and started throwing red paint around the store and caused about $5,000 worth of damage. Uh, and the cops were called and we managed, we did manage to keep our people out of jail, but it was, it was pretty hairy there for a minute. Furry. Furry indeed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had the cops yell at us a bunch for this signs on sticks. And so then we could just hold the sign on a piece of cardboard. But the cops almost came and arrested my partner, Richard Taylor, who's on the first episode because he was playing the Toxic Avenger theme song on his accordion. And the police in Park City did not appreciate uh, him walking around playing the accordion. Uh, they And so then Lloyd kept calling it the the weapon of music destruction out there in Park <laughs> City. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I mean, there was always all sorts of antics. And like this happens everywhere we go. It's obviously like, it's been well documented in in movies like All the Love You Can because with it, the same stuff we did at Cannes Film Festival is the same stuff we did in Park City, um, and the same stuff we do basically anywhere we go. I remember my first year we had, I believe it was a volunteer either owned or rented, like one of those long limousines, long truck limousine kind of things, and they put a giant trauma dance banner on it and just drove up and down Main Street until the cops told them to stop. <laughs> but they would just drive around the block and sit for like 15 minutes and then come back and just go down Main Street. You have to think on your toes when you're when you're working with trauma, because all of the money that we put into the festival was simply just to, like, get the programs printed and the flyers and get Lloyd out there and get the team out there. Like, even though I was a trauma employee at the time, a full time employee, like I wasn't paid any extra to go out there. I covered my own transportation. I covered my own food. And that's just something you sort of accept when you work for trauma is that you are you are doing it for the love of it and you're not doing it to get paid and you're not even doing it necessarily to stay warm. But, uh, you know, you're doing it because you love being a part of it. So you're saying after working for trauma for over 20 years, you were not some major conglomerate multimillionaire the only multimillionaires I'm aware of that have anything to do with trauma are Lloyd and Michael and, uh, I, you know, James Gunn. <laughs> and James Gunn. Yeah. I mean, I don't know their personal finances, but I think they're doing OK. Yeah, certainly trauma has not helped me get rich by any stretch of the imagination, but it has made my life rich in a lot of other ways. So I'm very grateful to have been part of it and to continue to still be a small part of it, which I think is kind of funny, like how our paths crossed. I was throwing a trauma concert out here in Colorado and having known you and talked to you several times on the internet, I had no idea you were from Colorado. Right. And then you showed up at, uh, I think, I think we were doing a screening of maybe class of Newcomb high or something. I think you saw me wearing a trauma shirt. Like, Oh, trauma, you, you go into the trauma thing over there. And it's like, hi, I'm Zach. You're like, Oh, I, I worked for trauma. Chris was like, Oh my God. Chris, that fear. <laughs> <laughs> that is the only time that's ever happened to me, by the way. You're welcome. The, the only time someone has ever said, oh, my God, you're Chris Land fear from from the message boards, from the message boards. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was actually a really fun moment because, I mean, I, I don't associate with like the star power, like mentality or whatever, and just certainly don't consider myself one of those. But the fact that you knew who I was and were not a member of my immediate family was very cool. <laughs> and then and then just, you know, like. Through happenstance, you know, I started my show and then a few weeks later you were like, you know, I, I was totally gearing up to start my own trauma podcast <laughs> at the same point. So we just kind of kept in touch and exchanged ideas. Yeah, it was really kind of cool the way that sort of came together. Trauma has never been, even when I was like a, you know, card carrying employee, it was never my full time job because you can't eat on a trauma salary. Like ask any of our interns that have starved. It's always been something I've done sort of on the back burner as like just a way to kind of contribute because, you know, I, I kind of grew up with the brand and kind of have always appreciated what it stood for. But yeah, I've always maintained other other jobs uh, while I worked for trauma. And and even to this day, like my full time job is, is not trauma, never has been, at least in the sense of like, you know, paying my bills and things like that. But yeah, it's it's really kind of cool. The way this happened was um, I had initially been wanting to do a trauma radio show going all the way back to traumaville.com. It was actually one of the first things I pitched when I got hired. 
And we had talked about doing a, and again, this would have been way ahead of the curve because we're talking 1999, 2000 here. It would have been a full-time, 24-hour, seven-day-a-week internet radio show with stories from Tromaville, interviews with actors, musicians, artists that have either been like part of trauma or been inspired by trauma and also like playing a lot of the music that was part of the movies and other stuff that fit in with that sort of genre. When Tromaville.com ended, that idea kind of went by the wayside and I toyed with it over the years of like trying to figure out a, a new way to do it. And I had always loved, I had always loved radio. And when podcasts started becoming a thing, I had always wanted to do something in the podcast realm as well. Cut to 2018, along with my partner, Charles Kelly, we started a podcast and uh, internet radio station that is Loudspeaker, and that's the Loudspeaker Studios that uh, we are sitting at right now. It was so cool because you're like, hey, I'd, I'd like to work with you and also help shoulder some of the burden. Because before I was writing, producing, researching, doing everything just all in my basement, as well as being a full time worker and a full-time father mm-hmm. and uh y- you know just navigating all that so i really appreciate this awesome opportunity i'm glad to help i mean we have you know a lot of similar ideas about kind of like what we enjoy about this community and and the films and like the aesthetic so you know i'm i'm just happy that you know you 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 know felt comfortable enough to say yes and say like hey let's let's try to make this something more together i mean that means a lot I, I'm sure the audience is is curious to know what the show is going to look like, or I guess sound like, because it's an audio medium. So what my pitch to you was kind of, let's do a mutated version of This American Life, which for those of you who don't know, This American Life is one of the most popular podcasts and radio shows in the world. But really what they do is they take interesting stories about people and tell them in a way that's really designed for the audio medium. They tell really compelling stories and really like compelling characters. What we talk about in terms of like trauma and the characters in the universe and the movies and, you know, people like Lloyd Kaufman is like, they're already compelling on their own. So I kind of wanted to just merge those two ideas together and explore things in more in kind of an investigative way. And like, you know, sort of a playful investigative journalism. Like yeah. if you think about your favorite murder podcast, but make it about like silly movies with dick and fart jokes instead of murder, that's kind of what I'm going for. And I think I would be the perfect Ira glass hole. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think you absolutely would. What you've been doing with the show so far has been has been wonderful. And every time I would listen to an episode, I would go, man, this is really great. But here are like two ideas I have that I think could make it even more interesting or more compelling. And so I'm just happy to, you know, take the years that I've had now as a as a radio and podcast producer to try to try to make that a reality. I think we should maybe tease some of the the subjects, um, ideas that we have. And, and if anybody, if there's a idea that you want to hear about out there, please feel free to to tweet the at talk and trauma. Uh, let us know like, oh, I'd love to hear a story about this. But, uh, you know, let's kind of talk about a couple of our ideas that we were thinking maybe for this first first season, I guess, season three. One of the first ideas I think I mentioned to you was wanting to do a real deep dive on the insane troubled production that was Tales from the Crapper. Yes. Um, because what a lot of people may not know about that particular anthology film is that what the final film ended up being is not anywhere close to what it was supposed to be. And there is a documentary called The Thin Brown Line that takes a lot of the the details, some of the trials and tribulations. But that was actually a really significant point in Troma's history for several reasons, one of which being that it involved the uh, co-production from a Playboy Playmate who later fled the country. Uh, It also was pretty directly responsible for the closing of our only satellite office in Los Angeles. Uh, Tromaville, L.A., rest in peace. There, There's a lot of untold story there um, that I'd really like to explore with a lot of the people that had worked on it and lived through it. That one was going to be the initial launching uh, episode, uh, but then I decided to kind of push that one back a little bit, like because every 
bit I kept uncovering or our researching, it it has more of a story there. You know, even just the Troma LA offices could be an episode on on their own. So mm-hmm. it's uh it's going to be an epic one. It's going to be epic and it, yeah, it's definitely something that has a lot of meat on the bone to sort of chew on and wade through. So I'm glad that we're going to give that the time that it needs cuz that may even end up being two episodes, I don't know, cuz yeah. there's just a lot to tell there that I think a lot of people certainly don't know and in many cases haven't heard before. Uh, so I'm interested to do that. I've also long wanted to do a sort of deep dive on the history and resurgence of the Toxic Crusaders cartoon series, which, uh, I mean, one of the cool things that's happening right now as we're recording this is uh, a company called Retroware is in production on a Toxic Crusaders video game available for PC as well as consoles that you know, will allow you to play as all of the Crusaders as well as Yvonne and Toxie's mom. With all new animation, it's a story that continues the uh, story from the original 13 episode cartoon, Uh, has new voice acting, new animation, kick ass soundtrack of which there's a sampler available on streaming platforms right now. But uh, between that and the recent action figures and just like the recent reinterest in Toxic Crusaders in general, um, I feel like it'd be good to sort of talk about where we got to here and then kind of how we got. There. Yeah, that it'll be a pretty interesting one to deep dive in. And especially for some of the guests that I I have envisioned for that episode will be really cool. Another one that I'm excited to talk about, and I sort of kind of tease a little bit in the Lloyd episode that I did, but the, the films of Louis Sue, AKA dirty uncle Lloyd, <laughs> <laughs> AKA Stanley L Kaufman jr. Yeah. AKA David Stitt. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. For those of you who don't know or don't, don't, uh, don't know those names, Louis Sue and David Stitt were nom de plumes that Lloyd used in the early seventies and late sixties when he sort of cut his teeth working on adult films. And some of that is mentioned in the, in the last season finale interview with Lloyd, but we really want to dive deep into that previously unexplored aspect of trauma's history uh one of the cool things i think about that episode will be talking about some of these adult films or porn- pornographic films that lloyd made but porn in the in that era is very different than what you get on porn hub uh these days there was production value and story and plot and a lot of his directing beats carry over into his movies that you still kind of see today, which is really funny and and weird. So, yeah, it's it's very interesting. And, and the fact that like, yeah, porn, like you said, porn in the 70s is not porn as it is today. Up until the late 70s or early 80s, when videotape became a thing, um, porn was considered just about on par with uh, mainstream films and Lloyd, you know, cut his teeth in directing. And in fact, that's not uncommon for a lot of industry talent is they sort of cut their teeth doing what they do in porn on the production side and, and using that experience to start working on on films that are outside of the porn world. So he directed, what, five or six films yeah. um, during that time. And you know, like I said, as various names and believe it or not, those movies do still exist somewhere and we'll be talking about them so i'm excited to dive into that part of the history i don't know if lloyd will be that excited but you know we're gonna give it a shot <laughs> that that'll it'll be our uh our first uh, cease and desist episode <laughs> <laughs> possibly but you know we, that's what lawyers are for it's fine yeah we'll we'll pull, roll out the big uh talking trauma lawyers yeah exactly our <laughs> Our top dollar talking trauma lawyers. <laughs> the same ones that got me out of jail. Don't mess with us. <laughs> and, and then I think, you know, one, I think maybe one more teaser on uh, on on one. And, you know, there probably be a few more episodes in this. But the true tale of trauma team video. Yes. Trauma team video, which still technically exists, although it's not really referred to that as anymore. And Lloyd's mentioned this before and in, in other other formats and venues. But. You know, there's there's really something to be said about Troma starting their own video company right before the video market essentially collapsed in on itself. Um, and, a lot, you know, all of this sort of happened in the late 90s. And I feel like there's some really interesting stories to tell, like why in the hell 
was one of the first Trauma Team video releases, Class of Newcom High Part 3, and not the first film or the second film. Or, or something that you let me know that I had no idea of. Everybody knows uh, the infamous Trauma building in Hell's Kitchen, mm-hmm. but nobody knows of right across the street, the Trauma Team video headquarters where they kept all their boxes of VHS tapes. Correct. Yes, I believe that was... So the original trauma building was at 733 9th Avenue and the trauma team video building was directly across the street, also on 9th Avenue. I want to say it was 757 or 752 or something like that. But yeah, that building housed trauma team video as well as traumaville.com. And uh, that wasn't a building that we owned. That wasn't like the trauma building that we just owned, you know, hundred percent, but it was space that we leased and it was operated at least at first as kind of a separate unit from trauma proper. It was a division that was headed by first by a man named Tony Rosen. Um, and then afterwards by, you know, several different people. But I think there's a, a lot of fun history to uncover about trauma's video label. And also, um, around the same time, there was a trauma UK video label that was launched. Um, and so I feel like there's some interesting stories to talk about there. Like, what in the hell is the trauma basement? Where yes. did that come from? How did that come to be? Who is Miss Trauma and can I get her phone number? All of these questions and the secrets of the pyramids will be be uh, on this season of Talk and Trauma. But yeah, late, coming up in this episode, we're going to talk to a couple of young filmmakers about their uh, trauma films that are coming out. But before we go to them, Chris, where can people follow you on the social webs? Uh, you can just follow our public radio station, Loudspeaker. We are at Hey, H-E-Y, Loudspeaker on all of the platforms. If you really want to follow me for some reason, you can find me at Mr. Lanfear, the you know most creative name in the universe. That was your screen name on the trauma message board. It absolutely was. Um, but yeah, just follow everything we're doing at loudspeaker.org is the best way to hear this show and many other wonderful shows. After the break, we'll hear from Liam Reagan about his new trauma production, Eating Miss Campbell. Later, we talk with Ben Johnson about his new film, Curse of the Were Deer. But first, we've got to pay some bills. This is Talking Trauma with your host, Zach Bynes. Oh, Beth, would you eat me? My name is Beth Connor, and for the past 17 years, my life has gone straight to video. On-demand streaming channels will pay a handsome seven figures for an, gee whiz, a school shooting. This school is enabling school massacres by allowing students to choose between either killing their friends or killing themselves. Planning on inviting Miss Campbell to the Organ Eat Massacre contest. You know, if you don't have a boner for Miss Campbell, you could always attend to mine. For lack of a better term, problematic. Z Kyle! What is this woke shit? Well, that's one way to deal with unruly students dressed as former presidents. Together, we could rid the world of this toxic, self-appointed patriarchy that serve nothing to womankind but pain and grief. And what is more poetic and American than a high school massacre? So, I want to introduce Mr. Liam Ringham. Zach, it's a pleasure to be back on Talking Trauma. I'm glad, glad to have you back. Eating Miss Campbell is is done. It's out there. Start doing the screening route. Tell it. Tell everybody more about Eating Miss Campbell. For the trauma fans out there, Eating Miss Campbell is a semi spiritual sequel to My Bloody Banjo, which you can now watch on Trauma Now, which is four dollars ninety nine a month with the first one free. Yeah, so Eating Miss Campbell follows on from that, and we started shooting January twenty twenty. And we shot for 17 days and I wrote a script that was like 75 pages because at that point I could only afford to pay people for 17 days. And I'm like, okay, we could probably do three pages a day or whatever we worked out on the calculations anyway. And I just thought 75 pages, you know, yes, we'll get some exterior shots. That'll be a 90 minute movie and get it. And then Jack, this editor I met, 20-year-old, fresh face, straight out of film school. Yeah, I met up with him after he did the initial assembly cut. I said, Jack, 
so what's the running time to this movie? I'm like, you know, you, is it going to be like a banjo? Is it 82 minutes? It's like, not really. I'm like, oh, uh, do we have a feature on our hands? You know, I'm worrying. Like, you say the worst that comes out of your mouth. Do we have a movie? And he's like, it's about 50 minutes. And I'm like, well, I don't think we can shoot 40 minutes worth of exterior strikes. And this film. <laughs> So then the little thing called COVID-19 happened. You may have heard of it in America. It's known as the 9-11 of viruses. And it shut down production. It shut down production in eight, for 18 months. Um, unfortunately, in that time, I lost my best friend, Blade Braxton, who had a pivotal role in the movie as The Midnight Rose. And whilst I was rewriting to, to, to reshoot after the pandemic cleared, you know, he, he, you know, he passed away. And that's when you invited me on to the Talking Trauma um, show. And I think that's the first time we may have spoken over, the, you know, the microphone, video, whatever. You know, we, we chatted online via messenger, but I don't think we ever spoke over the yeah, phone. I think that's the first time. That's right. Yeah, dude, completely, you know. And uh, so during that time, after, the, you know, the, the Suck of the Vampire episode, uh, we went into production maybe a few months later to finish the movie. And it's so weird because the first leg of the production we shot for 17 days, the second leg of the production, 18 months later, we shot for seven days. But you could argue that half the movie was, you know, half the movie is the second shoe. And then the other half is the first shoe. So really, I could have probably saved 10 days, you know, pay people <laughs> if I had a more coherent script. But it's so weird because in January 2020, we didn't have the likes of Trauma alumni like Justin A. Martel, who plays Tusk Everbone. We didn't have Annabella Rich, who played Nancy Applegate. What I'm trying to say is we created new characters and we had to bring people back to, to film. One of the mean girls were like seven months pregnant. So you could probably tell. Yeah. <laughs> As a whole, when it's all edited together, and I feel like when you're working within the trauma system, when it's a very much a hyper reality, like instead of Traumaville in my, my fictional town called Hen and Lotter, I think you can get away with it. And uh, I've not had people question these things, but now I'm revealing all my secrets through talking trauma. But since then, yes, it's played the festival circuit, had a world premiere at Fryfest in London, Leicester Square last summer. 300 people sold out downstairs. It was a fantastic evening. It's then gone on to play festivals in Europe, it's, it's, play, it's had a limited theatrical run. And the limited theatrical run in America, we played Smod Castle that Kevin Smith hosted. Kevin Smith was going to moderate the Q&A, and then I guess he wasn't supposed to be there that day because he, he didn't turn up. So you know, me traveling to America with over 100 posters with Kevin Smith on them for the event, event posters to sell. And then when I land and I'm waiting to go through security, at the airport at JFK, and I look at my emails because there's nothing else to do, and I see, oh, Kevin Smith can't make it. Well, we're going to get a comic book man guy to host it. I really didn't have the heart to tell my producer who was flying, so my line producer, Daddy Naylor, who was flying over, I guess, just because Kevin Smith was hosting. I didn't have the heart to tell him, and I felt so bad. I think the first person I messaged was you. And I think I said something like, Law or something. I don't know. It was one of those points where it's like, for 15 minutes, I was trying to process it, but then I just accepted it and thought, fuck it, we're going to have a great time anyway. And, you know, I got pretty high before the screening. Outside Quick Stop, of all places, you know, and they keep very poetic. I was told that, you know, I, I kind of ripped on Kevin Smith a couple of times during the screening, <laughs> jokingly. But no, he played Smart Castle, he played New York, it played. Where else? L.A. Played L.A. three nights. Sold out. The Lemley Theatre in Glendale. And yeah, now we're just planning the Blu-ray release. We're just trying to put it together. I'm sure there's going to be a few more screenings in America. The festival run for me is probably dwindling down, if not you know, at a halt right now. But hopefully at the end of the year, we'll have the Eames Campbell on Blu-ray via my distribution company, Refuse Films, in the U.K. and uh, Trauma. This is kind of cool for those listening is that you actually had Troma produce the movie, not just distribute it. Can you talk a little bit about, because I'm sure the, there's people out there who I hear from all the time who are like, well, I'm, I have a script and I want Troma to produce it. Can you talk about how that was for you? So I met my bloody banjo in 2015. And that was to me, I kind of love that trauma in a way. I mean, I'm very much influenced by trauma in, in many ways, as well as other filmmakers like Frank Henelotter, Trey Parker, 
Hans Solans, um, et cetera, Charles Band. But it was, you know, I, the, 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 the people that got me into filmmaking were Lloyd and Michael. So when Banjo did the festival circuit, et cetera, I did reach out to Lloyd to ask, you know, would Trauma be interested in releasing it? And because it wasn't a Trauma production per se, and at that time, Lloyd was saying what the video market is as, as it is. If you can get money elsewhere, go for it. And to be fair, Lloyd was the only honest person I spoke to during that whole time because I was fed lies by the distributors and sales agents where they were like, oh, well, we've been getting Walmart and they'll do this, I'll do that. And we won't sell it for, you know, minimum to a foreign territory. And then you realize all they do is pocket the money. They bury you in expenses. And, you know, it really demoralized me. And I'm sure it's happened to a lot of filmmakers. I think when you've put out, when you've made your own passion project, because you're, you're in it to tell a story, you're in it to convey an emotion. You don't, you don't really, like film school doesn't really look to teach you about the film business or what to do with your film once you've done it. Now, the, to me, I, you know, I'm all for being an artist. And, you know, I know many artists that are like, well, fuck consumerism, fuck the business part. But unfortunately, it's called the film business for a reason. If you don't yeah. make business with your first film, you're not going to make a second. Or if you are, it's going to take a long time, which happened to me. So when I was gearing up for Ian Miss Campbell, or at that time it was called Parents Evening, Lloyd was very interested in wanting to produce it and wanting to distribute the film. And, you know, I knew after failing on Banjo and making mistakes that I, I would love nothing more than for Trauma to produce it. But I, at the business end, you know, I wanted to retain some rights as well. So Trauma purchased the North American rights to Ms. Campbell. However, it is a Trauma team production produced by Lloyd. And with Trauma now, they, they have direct distribution in America, but not so much worldwide. They license it to other distributors. So if you're a filmmaker... You know, by all means, yeah. If you've met something before, please approach Lloyd, and I'm sure that I'd be happy to take a look for your next project. And you know, for me, try and retain as many rights as you can, and you know, make, make a business deal. I think Trump would be impressed with your business prowess if you didn't give him everything. How involved was Troma with the? the actual production and shooting, or did they give you notes like on the script, like, Hey, if we're going to give you some money, we need you to do this. So, the, you know, there were some things that, you know, genre films kind of need mm. to take a box, blood, sex, and beasts, you know? So within the trauma contract, we added two scenes of nudity and also a stunt just because, and I totally understand. Some foreign markets need these things, sex and violence, or, or, or stunt, should we say, to make the film look big. To you know, if, if if the film sucks, at least they've got something to sell to a market. So I understand that mentality. So I, you know, I did. It, the film was already traumatized to begin with. There's fucking dicks being bitten off, fingers being bitten off, ears being ripped off, everything. Right? It's a trauma movie. I, I never shot nudity before, but you know. What, what do I know? Because the film was a lot more successful with Banjo that had no nudity apart from prosthetic penis, which is technically nudity, I guess. But in terms of notes, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I gave Lloyd a, I sent him the script. He liked the script. He made some suggestions, but, I, and I think it helped because I made My Bloody Banjo prior to that. He kind of let me have full reign and I, I really appreciate that. And I don't think many other producers would do that, especially when money's involved. I don't think there's many producers that don't want to have some kind of creative control, but also from a narcissistic perspective as well. Because when money is involved, the person that spends the money makes the choice, makes the decisions. What you're saying? The line is very trusting, and I feel, and I feel like that is really what trauma is about. Deep down, it's about the artist's vision. It's about the author's vision and you know hence why trauma celebrates filmmakers trauma celebrates director's cuts trauma celebrates what the director's vision is and not to be compromised so yeah man you know a great work in trauma great work with lloyd and i wouldn't hesitate to uh, do business with them in future there's always this misconception that when you are getting a movie produced or put out you're gonna make tons and tons of money or have tons and tons of money and then we always hear from other people, it's like, oh, Troma gave me nothing or, you know, very little money. Were you surprised by the amount or lack of funds from Troma? Oh, no. I mean, look, look, Troma, 
gave me money. And, you know, to be completely honest with you, yeah, you know, so when I say they gave me money, I invested the majority of the share into the production. But in a way, I don't think I'd have it any other way with a film like Ian Miss Campbell because, yes, I do have control and everything, but trauma has been around for 50 years now almost. You know, so at any time, they could have really pulled the the creative control string and they never did. They actually let me have free reign in, in a lot of respects. But no, what, you know, over the years, being a trauma fan, I, you know, and I'm sure you have the same, Zach, we've heard these horror stories, these audio commentaries, these blog interviews where people uh, say, oh my God, I didn't make any money from trauma or trauma ripped me off or whatever. But, you know, the thing to me, when you're going into a deal, okay, and you, you don't understand the deal, then that's not the distributor's fault. That's not the sales. That's not trauma's fault. That's your fault. That's your fault for not understanding the industry and the business. Now, at least trauma are honest. With Banjo and I went with Maxing Media, they told me a pack of lies. And I believed it because I was a naive first time filmmaker. And you feel pretty vulnerable by the end of the festival when you're broke, tired, you've you, you know, you've traveled all over trying to pull out the movie. And now the, you know, the final leg is essentially home video. And when people are promising Walmart and people are promising, you know, having a factory press release of your film and not a film put on a DVD out, Amazon made on demand. And you've done all these deliverables. You've spent so much in special features and they don't fucking use them. Fuck them, you know. Trauma has been nothing but, if anything, I haven't made money with trauma. So, you know... The aroma do trauma equals mucho dolorero. Since we last talked, you created your own distribution label where you're self-distributing a Blu-ray in the UK, My Bloody Banjo, and then coming up, Eating Miss Campbell. Can you talk a little bit about what made you want to even create your own distribution label? Again, you know, learning from trauma, I mean, reading Lloyd's books and, you know, sell your own damn movie, produce your own damn movie, and make your own damn movie. Direct your own damn movie and all I need to know about filmmaking, I learned from the Toxic Avenger. But yeah, dude, like seriously, as a fan of trauma and you see a studio doing everything in house in 1995, Lloyd and Michael created a trauma team video, you know, possibly because they weren't getting the guarantees that they used to get in the eighties for, from other licenses. So they created trauma team video and they self distributed and you'd see ads with James Gunn and others saying, Hey, buy this classic my three, two pack for X amount. Because back in the day, and I watched in a video star in the late nineties, early two thousands to get a retail copy, sorry, to get a rental copy, sorry, of a VHS would cost like 50 pounds. Or, uh, you know, maybe $100 in America or whatever, because the manufacturers of the, just, uh, of the licenses of that VHS will know that you could probably rent that film, you know, when it's like maybe every single night for a good few weeks and then you release, you gain three pounds sterling, you're making back about 50 pounds that you've purchased for it in the first month of promotion. So that's what they would do. Uh, and there was big money in that. Now, seeing Trauma do that, and seeing their releases on DVD, because, you know, the first DVD I ever owned, I mean, let's be honest, the only way I really knew about a DVD was Trauma. When they released first Toxic Avengers, Kabuki Man, Tromeo, and Class Nukem High, those, I'm like, what the fuck's a DVD? It's on a CD? How does that work? Oh, it's like a smaller version of Laserdisc. So I think that seeing how Maxim Media Trap Banjo yeah. They gave me a whole new poster. They, they, they retitled the movie. It, the original title of My Bloody Banjo is Banjo. But I kind of, you know, it's one of the, maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, because I'm using My Bloody Banjo now. <laughs> you know, I think it's, yeah, it's probably Stockholm Syndrome, but I prefer the title that they made me change it too. But looking at me, Mark, the movie didn't really get it. And I just felt like, well, I think there's money to be made in distribution. I think there's money. I think there's a market out there. And I, you know, I'm a fan of physical media. I, I'm not in it for the business side. I mean, the business side is great, but I also am the people I'm trying to sell to. I love it. I, I buy the vinegar syndrome. I buy the Severin. I buy the ATA film. I buy the Arrow video. I buy the trauma. I buy the full moon. I buy, I buy all those, all, all those releases. I double dip. I triple dip. I quadruple dip. I will rebuy a movie a million times because I like it so much. I probably yeah. don't. And sure you do that. Trust Avenger and Tromeo and Juliet probably five, six, seven times over on different formats with different distributors because we love the film. And well, pretty I, soon I, we're going to get that 4K Toxic Avenger that oh, we exactly. run out. Of I, don't even have a 4- I don't even have a 4K player yet, but I'm sure I'll get one just for that. It's, I mean, for me, yeah, my, 
It was my second DVD was a trauma DVD with Sergeant Kabuki Man, but I did not have a DVD player yet. But no. I was like, well, now I need to get one because I have, I have two DVDs. Completely, dude. And, and then that's the reason why I'm like, okay, well, I know my buddy Banjo more than anybody, and I've got all I've got this array of special features. I've got, you know, you know, the director's got the movie. You can check out the festival cut. You can check out the short film. You can check out the proof of concept trailer. There's a making up documentary, which you've seen, Zach, which is arguably more entertaining than the movie. You can also tell that we're students of Troubleville by having these making of documentaries. Because I feel like, you know, the, the gritty on the do it yourself first time filmmaker can definitely relate to our struggles making a movie, especially if they haven't done it before. It's like they're more likely to run into problems that we we've run into than problems that Francis Ford Coppola ran into on Apocalypse Now. Thank you, Francis Ford Coppola. I, I do think <laughs> on part three, though. You know, that's a great movie with Andy Garcia. Anyway, yeah, like the making of those films, like the trauma documentaries, Fast of Darkness, Apocalypse Soon, Poultry in Motion. I wanted to watch an old documentary because growing up, watching behind the scenes on Sky Movies, for example, or on a DVD, everything's really poly and chummy. Oh, we're having a great time filming with them. This director is so good to work. It doesn't happen on micro-budget film set. That is all... <laughs> Smoke and mirrors, my friends. You know, it, it's hard. You know, you've only got so much time in the day. Everyone's kind of green to this thing, or we're all learning, we're all processing, and some people aren't cut out for it. And, you know, they, it, it results in mental breakdowns. It results in relationships being tarnished. But, but you know, and this is all real stuff. But conflict is drama. And, you know, you watch any kind of reality TV show, they're all scripted. There's a reason why they're scripted, because they have to put conflict in for entertainment, because conflict is entertainment. There's drama, there's a struggle, there's an arc there, even though it is real. And, yeah. uh, you know, so the documentary, I, I feel, is equally as good as the director's cut of My Bloody Banjo, if not better. So, yeah, if people want to, this is a cheap plug right now, but if you want to buy My Bloody Banjo limited edition, on Blu-ray, Factory factory Press, 1,000 copies, signed and numbered individually by director Liam Regan, playable worldwide, fuck region coding. You can go up to refuse.com <laughs> and check out this cool link tree that I made whilst in Spain. I'm looking so cool before I guess I want to design me a proper website. But Or else if you're in America and you don't want to pay those shipping fees, then you can also pick it up at Masca Video or at Diabolic DVD. I'm really excited for people to see Eating Miss Campbell. It's such a fun movie. It looks like you had a really good time filming it. Everyone looked like they're having so much fun. <laughs> what was your budget? And uh, and what what <laughs> camera did you shoot on? No, but I'm fucking with you. Like it's it's a good movie, and, and I'm not just saying that because we're friends. It's <laughs> one one of those that's gonna go like in like when people are having the discussion of. Troma movies, Eating Miss Campbell is going to be in that discussion. Oh, dude, seriously, that means the world to me. Yeah, it really yeah. does. Eating Miss Campbell, it means a lot that you said that, Zach. You know, I, I discovered trauma films at 11 years old. I've been a student of trauma, not just the in house classics, but uh, yeah, equally as, as the pickups that I hold in such high regard. Um, it means a lot, and I wanted to always, as a as a wee young lad from Penis Town or near Penis Town, Sheffield, Full Monty territory. But you know, wants to make a trauma film, and when they asked me in school, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know, they tried to live like job advisors. I think they've got them in America, right? Career yeah. advisor, right? And I said, you know, I want to be a filmmaker. They said to me, well, yeah, there's not many filmmakers that come out of South Yorkshire, Rotherham, where I'm from. What does your dad do? Maybe you could go into the coach industry, you know, <laughs> or like, you know, very, very encouraging. But I never gave up on the dream. And Banjo, you could argue, is a trouble movie. When the rights to Maxi Media, there's only one home for that movie and it is trauma. But yeah, E, Miss Campbell, thank you. I, it's, it's, it means a lot that you said that. I don't know what else to say. I mean, that is such a compliment because. I hold these movies in such high regards. And when I, people ask me, so what's your favorite movies? I'll name Combat Shock, I'll name Tromeo and Julia, I'll name Cannibal the Musical, I'll name Tosca Avenger. I'm like, no, 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 what's your favorite movies? And I'm like, no, I just said them. I just said them. I just said my favorite movies. You know, it's not like there's a fucking 
it's not 1940s Germany where we're segregating movies right now. You know, <laughs> it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Zach, and I hope to make it out to Colorado again and we can have more trauma adventures. It's been great and people can follow me, Refuse Liam, on social media or Refuse Films. And, you know, if you like eating Miss Campbell, please leave it a review on IMDb or Letterboxd because fuck Frasier Brown. <laughs> well, and I, I will say it's really important that people leave reviews because if it helps the algorithm to keep that movie popping up on people's feeds. So That's it is correct. very, very important for people to leave a review. Because if not, there'll be some troll called Frasier Brown coming to fuck up your movie, you know? As a nonprofit, everything we do at Loudspeaker could not be possible without the generous support of our listeners. Become part of the Loudspeaker family and pledge your support now at loudspeaker.org. are we making? <laughs> Sounds like they're having fun over there. That was the trailer for Curse of the Were Deer. And we are here with Troma alum and director of Curse of the Were Deer, Ben Johnson. Hey, hello, hello. How are you? Good. So, for those of us who don't know about Curse of the Were Deer, tell us how it came to be. Our kind of idea guy is Derek. He's come up with a bunch of the things that we shot. Him and his writing partner, kid named Joe Duff, who I didn't know from Adam, came up with the whole Where Deer thing. And then Derek wrote Wet Works, which have, have you watched that on Troma now? I have not yet. If you get a chance, it's pretty good. It's got Blade Braxton in it. Oh, uh, nice. Blade, great. Yeah, Midnight Rose. So Derek comes up with these things and it was 2019 and he's like, Hey, you guys should come out to Missouri and we'll shoot a movie in my mom's garage. And again, here I am like, now I'm 39 and I'm like, this sounds like the best idea ever. <laughs> yeah. Why not, bro? Let's, let's do it. So we did. And that was like everything we've done. And, and I'm sure with you too. As you go and you grow, it's, it's one of those things you keep realizing where you fuck up and you try not to repeat those fuck ups as you go along on wet works. The kid that was supposed to bring the camera didn't, didn't bring a camera. I shot full uh, movies without cameras. It almost got to that dude. It literally almost got to that. The kid who was supposed to bring the backup camera also did not bring a camera. I was basically showing up to, to sort of help Derek with writing. He was directing. We were still trying to find a star for it, which I convinced him that he had to be that star. I was like, no, you have to be the, the pedophile in the, in the movie. It has to be you. And he's like, man, I can't find nobody to do it. I can't find nobody to do it. Yeah. Well, no wonder, right? Like look at the character that you wrote. It's despicable. You have to do it. But lo and behold, like I, I just got a camera and I brought it down and I was just going to take like set stills, you know, yeah. I was going to do some art department stuff, take some set stills. The kid who cut it, John Bergio, 
did some quick Google searches. He set all of our fucking parameters on the camera, did everything. And due to a challenge with our DP taking shots of moonshine at eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, Jesus. And pardon me. And then proceeding to pass out with his ass in our water for the day. I became the de facto DP for that. <laughs> first thing I literally swear to God, dude, first thing I had shot since probably 2004 or 2005. And, and I, I think we did okay. I think we did okay. And, uh, Derek was very happy with it. So that's all that matters. If the director's happy, we're all happy. Done. And how did it come about where you took the hell of director for Weird Deer? That was just because I kept pushing everybody to be like, no, 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 guys, I want to do this. I I think this is the thing that we should do. We'd made a number of shorts. We, we fucked around with a couple of 48 hour film festivals. And then John Bergio, he's edited a bunch of our stuff. He's also directed some amazing things like what is it? Master Exploder he did while he was still in school. It's exceptional. And then he shot another thing called Ready Ready that if you ever get a chance to see, it's it's a riot. It's it literally a story about what happens when a kid tries to swing over the top bar of the swing set. Nice. Very, very simple, simple story, right? Very good. But yeah, I wouldn't let it, I just kind of wouldn't let it die. Derek sent me over a few pages and then we have a mutual friend, Jimmy Adamson, who's the drummer for the big feet works on Joe Bob Briggs worked on Shitstorm, does all sorts of this amazing stuff. And I was like, Derek, I love what you've written. Let me send it to Jimmy, send it over to Jimmy and was like, Jimmy, Derek did a great job. Rewrite this like instantly. Yeah. It was just like, you know what to do. And Jimmy sat there and he sends me back a much shorter version and with a whole lot more dicks getting ripped off. And then I sent it back to the team and I was like, we should shoot this trailer. Derek wants to make a trailer. I'll facilitate it. I'm going to direct it. Derek has to star in it. And I just kind of was like this. I have vision, I have vision for it, which sounds like the snobbiest fuck thing to say in the world. But I did like, I knew what that should look like. And then that became the trailer. And, and again, this is, we've fallen into making this feature like yeah. nobody wanted to make it like well, real, like, well, real quick I, I think you should give like the, the quick elevator pitch for the audience so they know what curse of the were deer is all about well i like to tell people at its core it, it really is a story about the need for transparency in our relationships you know that's what i like to tell people <laughs> is what it is an idiot goes out for his bachelor party hunting trip Beer drinking, deer killing, sex and weekend. And he's bit by a mythical monster that exists in the woods, right? And that's, that's at its core, it is the Wolfman. Beyond that, we have strippers. We have a corrupt sheriff. We touch on everything from race relations with the cops to, again, the need for transparency in our relationships and at the end of the day, we, we like to think we spend a little bit of time with the fellers. Well, and you have such a lovely, like, just cast of characters. Like, everybody is just so fun in, the, in this movie. And I've, I've seen the rough cut. I can't wait to see, like, the, the finished product. But everybody in the movie, like, is, is just super funny. Haven't seen a leading man like your leading man before. And, and he takes some brave choices in this movie, which are super... It's just super funny, and I feel like unexpected. And then, of course, my heart always goes out to Babette Bombshell. My love. Yes. My love, Zach. Do you, <laughs> do you know my love is Babette Bombshell? I cannot, for the life of me, explain to you, like, like in so many ways, this movie wouldn't be what it is without Babs coming in and, like, whispering in, in the back of my ear. And then, you know, tickling under my butt cheeks. But that's a, that's another story. Don't tell Babs I ever said that. Babs Never has happened. a gentle hand. And those lips. No, like, fucking. So, but on the real, we would be like in a scene and 
people would be setting things up, moving stuff around. Everything's, you know, a giant clusterfuck and we're trying to figure stuff out. And Babette would come up to me and like literally just a gentle hand on the shoulder, whisper something in the ear and then a little pat on the back. And then it's like, oh, problem is solved. We, we know what's happening. We know exactly what's going on. There was a moment. This is, I swear to God, this happened. So it's the night where uh, Randy's having his, his sort of secondary transformation. Because as he does get bit, you know, he starts to transform too. There's a bunch of murders going on. Like life is no good. But he has this very dramatic sort of reckoning, right? With God himself at one point before he begins to, to transition again. Or we've got Randy, he's down on the ground, his hands are clasped, he's screaming at God, looks out the window, and not another cock sucking full moon. He falls over. We all cut, whole room, dead quiet, bro, dead quiet. Could hear nothing, because this kid just gave us fucking everything, right? Left it all on the table. Yeah. Then you hear Babs in the back. Like basically singing, like some humming through some old hymn, and just you're like, not only did it take this moment, but it slowly starts to grow a little bit, and then it's just I looked over at the corner, I see that just picking up stuff, just tidying up, moving on along, like that was great. Now we get back to work, we bring ourselves back into it. Because the rest of us were just sitting there gobsmacked and had no idea what to do after that. Yeah. Look over at Babs and it's like, oh, we get back to work. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah. And we do it subtly. We let Derek collect himself after that. That's good. Good. Thank you. Subtle notes, like all throughout. I will carry that with me. I swear to God, the rest of my life. Loved it. Love that sauce. <laughs> and then, and then too, would uh, subtly would be like, oh, and you and I talked briefly before this, but about a couple of pickup shots. Hey, while we're here, why don't we grab one of this? That's a good idea. Yeah, everybody else is over here. Just turn the camera around. Pick that up right quick. Okay, good. Let's do it. And everything that Babette Bonshell told us, help, help. It wasn't, it wasn't, how do you say it? It wasn't pushy. It wasn't like somebody trying to get, more in or are trying to take control or whatever. It, Bab saw the direction we were going in and elevated it. I think something that, that people don't realize about Babs when they, when they see her on the screen is, you know, you get the huge persona, you know, and the, the larger than life characters, but Babs is one of the most thoughtful, sweetest people that you could ever meet and also brings just such a wealth of knowledge to a set. And whether it's like personnel, like issues that she's like helping with, or it's, you know, doing makeup or, or what's the best angle to light a cock, like Babette bombshell, like knows their shit. Only amplifies, only amplifies and has suckled at the teeth of greatness all the way around. I mean. Babette's worked with everybody from Herschel Gordon Lewis, pals around with, uh, with John Waters. And as she mentioned on our show, totally tunular, a little plug there, as she mentioned there, met fucking Tom Baker, the fourth doctor at a bear bar in like Soho back in the day. <laughs> the yeah. Babs, Babs could just tell stories. And this. Really is should just turn into a plug for Babette Bab Bombshell's like, I mean, like social media is whatever Babs is like. I think I'm gonna go live and tell stories. It's like, well, I know what I'm gonna be listening to for the rest of my afternoon for the whole fucking day. Like that's that's literally it. And there are things that she has told me that I cannot tell in any public capacity that would Same. blow people's minds. Same. Blow their minds. Yeah. And to have that force on your first feature. To, to be able to have somebody and, and, you know, you've made, you've made movies, you, you understand there are going to be times when not everybody is constantly involved to be able to have that storyteller in the other room, to be able to take control of that group that isn't active and like in that moment over there is also a godsend because then what do you have less of? 
you have less like eyes lingering. You have less people like bogging down a situation and you have someone who can control it for you. Yeah. That's amazing. So amazing. everybody should cast Babs and, and pay, pay them lots of money to be in their oh, movie. Please do. Yeah. Constantly, constantly. Yeah. And then hire me to be Babette's assistant. Dumb. Yes. All day. But, and, and I guess, you know, even beyond that, like, you you look at other big personalities and inside sort of the trauma sphere, the, the trauma verse, we had Nadia White come out like Nadia turned in an amazing performance for us. There's a point where that you haven't got to yet that you will in the, in the next little bit that you watch Nadia's dramatic turn sort of in like in, in our second and third act is like Oscar worthy in my humble opinion, it is, I I've shown it to a bunch of people that know her and they're like, I love Nadia. I knew Nadia could act, but I didn't know Nadia could like, like act. I didn't know that this was there. And then I look at her and I, when I sent that over to Nadia too, I sent it over to her and I was like, look at what people have said about you. I just get like a bunch of like furry cat emojis back. And then a lot of the like, ah, and like she's also my heart. I just had dinner with her about three weeks ago. So very nice. Awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she and her husband were traveling around doing some wrestling and they came through Tennessee. So we sat down and had some dinner. So, and, and this isn't telling tales out of school, but it is one of the greatest moments for me on set. There was a lady who came down. Her name is Alice Winkler. You should look her up. She's an. Do I got to turn my search on? I mean, no, dude. She, <laughs> I mean, it, that's your call. That's personal uh, proclivities or whatever. She's deaf on Instagram. She's deaf out and about. She's been in a bunch of like indie stuff. Her and then Jessa Flux. They came out and joined us, right? And Jessa's in the same sort of circle, same sort of area. I will go on record and say. I didn't know them before this. I feel after having seen what they could deliver in the roles that, that we hired them for, that we gave them, I feel like they were completely underutilized. I think both of those women have so much more to give and were so gracious to, to grace us with what they did for our film. Uh, I can't wait to make another one because I only want to see these ladies do more. They were, they were exceptional. They were exceptional for, okay, it's you know, two strippers. You're going to be dressed as deer. There'll be a third stripper. She's dressed as a hunter, whatever. And they fuck come out, give us gold. And the whole time I'm just in the back of my head, I was like, I wish we had better roles. I wish we had better roles for them. I wish we had more for them to do. But Alice gave us the greatest bit of sound I've ever heard in my life, Zach. So there's a point. And, and again, this is the other thing that people don't understand when they go into doing like nude stuff, right? You have to be upfront with what you want, what you're looking for, and, and what the assignment is. There, there should never be any sort Surprises. of area. Yeah. No, no. That's the least classy thing you can do. So when I was talking to him beforehand, I was like, yeah, and you're going to kind of abuse these guys with your breast. Like that's the whole thing. You're going to beat the shit out of them with them. Is that a thing you're comfortable with? Absolutely. I love it. Great. Okay, good. So there's a point where she's on top of Derek as he's getting his lap dance and she just takes her boobs and is like, bam, 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 bam. Yell cut. Sound guys racking up. Like he's fucking rolling beside me. And I was like, what's going on, dude? And he just takes his headphones off, puts them on my ears. And he goes, listen to this. And all you hear is that, 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 that. it's just meat against meat as they're like <laughs> slapping his head. And he's like, this is the greatest sound I've ever recorded in my life. And I was like, <laughs> done is done. And again, like came out, they were wonderful and we can, it makes it sound cheap talking about it like that, but at the end of the day, that's what we needed for the movie. The shots in there, the yeah. audio is in there, and it's hands down one of the funniest fucking things we got. She also doubled as our blind stripper, Helen Killer. And that was the moment where I looked at her and I was like, if I had known this, 
like we we would have just made the blind stripper movie instead of anything else. Like, she was amazing. Her and Jessica both. Jesse gave us some lines. She gave us some whatever as she's walking around the club interacting with people. She gave us some bits. She gave us some stuff. And again, it's that double-edged sword, right? Like, I yeah. want to see them do so much more. I can't wait to work with those two again because yeah. I know we're going to do something tremendous. I'm super excited for everybody to see this. I can't wait to see it selfishly when it's all completed. It's re- It really is like, like, if you're a Trova fan, this movie is going to be one of those evergreen titles that's on oh, the shelf. And it's my heart. I can't, I can't wait for people to check it out. When can people expect to see this movie? Because are, are, right now you're in post-production. So do you have any, like, timelines? Or are you planning on doing the festival circuits? Or? We're looking at Trauma Dance this year for a premiere. So once dates for that are set, check Trauma.com. Uncle Lloyd Kaufman on all the socials to get all those updates. But yeah, we're looking at a trauma dance premiere. And then definitely my hope is that we go the route that maestro Liam Regan has gone. I hope to go that route. So yeah, we're definitely going to end up hitting some festivals. That's part of the plan. And then we want to be able to go and take her out on the, the trauma tour and hopefully hit some of those bigger theaters around there. If this thing doesn't play film noir, I'm going to, I'll, I'll blow my brains out. And where can people follow you and find out more what you're doing and what else are you? You also have a, another podcast as well. You can follow the fantasy shed at fantasy shed on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to find out about totally tunular, where we talk about cartoons every week, we just set up our YouTube and we just started going live there. You can find me at shit.house.productions on Instagram. Facebook doesn't like shit in our title, so I I said, fuck them. And I pretty much exclusively run it off of Instagram right now. I also do not like Twitter. Twitter is only used for pornography. But other than that, yeah, shit.house.productions on Instagram. I'm at yarn underscore Yeti if people want to reach out to me direct. We still do have some Where Do Your T-shirts. We've got some shitty short DVDs that we made. So if anybody wants any of that stuff, just reach out direct. I mail inside of about a week. Awesome. And thanks for so much for coming on. No, brother. Thank you for having me, man. This has been a party. Thank you. everybody so uh as you can see i'm not dead yet the show's not dead we got some pretty cool stuff thank you for ben and liam for talking about some of your films and and uh thank you chris and loudspeaker for not uh kicking me out of the street and leaving me to die homeless and covered in my own filth now i can live in the studio covered in my own filth and i appreciate that very much and everybody out there you can follow the show on Twitter at Talk and Troma or find out more on TalkandTroma.com. There's a website now. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Lego Larry. And as always, stay traumatized. This has been a listener-supported production of Loudspeaker Studios. For more on this and other programs, visit loudspeaker.org.